Thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm going to read from Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah is writing to the exiles of Israel who were in Babylon because of their sin. And Jeremiah is encouraging Israel to remain faithful. They're away from their home. They're away from the temple. They're away from the place where they can worship in the presence of God. And he's calling them to be faithful as exiles in a foreign land. Jeremiah 29 verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Jeremiah and God through Jeremiah tells the Israelites to be faithful. That even though they're in exile, they're there for a purpose and they're there for a mission that, that all the nations and all people would know the Lord God is Lord over all creation and the one whom they can be in relationship with for salvation. And because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, nothing has changed in that part of the mission. See, you and I, we're exiles. This is not our home. This city is not our home. This state is not our home. This country is not our home. And this world is not our home. We are exiles here and we have been called to the same mission to seek the welfare of the city around us and to pray to the Lord on its behalf so that they may know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we long for the day that he returns to take us home. And we have so many opportunities here at Northwood to participate on the mission of God, to seek the welfare of those around us. We do that locally, we do that nationally and internationally. And nationally, we have two major partners that we're working with right now. One of those is in Boston, Ivy Rose and Arbor Way Community Church. One of those is in Salt Lake City, Utah with Bobby Wood and Redemption Church. And we have opportunities coming up this summer. Those are really dark places and those are really lost places. And those are places that need the gospel. We have opportunities to go and partner there and sin. So I'm asking that you would pray, that you would pray for these locations, pray for these pastors, pray for the churches there. I'm asking that you would give, give toward the mission as we seek to take the gospel to places in our country. And I'm asking that you would go. We still need people to go to Boston this summer. We're doing a basketball camp and you don't have to know anything about basketball. We'll take care of it. But we want you to go to Boston this summer and we want you to go to Utah. Pastor Tommy's taking that team. Boston is July 7th through the 13th. Utah will be July 19th through the 25th. And so I'm asking that if you're at all interested, we still have spots, we still have time. Would you please go? Would you consider going and pray about that? Um, and please find me. Please come talk to me as, as we seek to see our, our nation and the cities around our nation reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you'll join me right now, we're going to pray for Ivy. We're going to pray for Bobby. And we're going to pray for the churches in these locations. Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you so much for Christ and for your spirit, God, and the gift of the gospel. We thank you that you have brought us into your family. And we, we recognize, God, that we're not home. And we long for the day that Jesus returns to make all this new. But in the meantime, you have called us to be faithful on your mission, God, to see those around us reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray for Ivy right now. I pray for the city of Boston. I pray for Arbor Way as they're trying to reach Jamaica Plain in particular. I pray that you would give him strength in these days. I pray that the church there would, would be faithful to share the gospel. And we as a church partner would be faithful to support them in praying and giving and going. I pray for Bobby Wood and Redemption Church, God. I pray for the work that's going on there, that, that you would allow them to continue to go forward and multiply churches in that area and that we would, we would be a good church partner. God, I pray that right now you would stir up people in this room, stir up their hearts by the work of your spirit to participate on the mission. God, um, we love you. We're so thankful that you've gifted us and resourced us and blessed us with the ability to even go. And I pray that we would seek the welfare of those around us that we really want them to know and love Jesus Christ. God, we love you. We praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
stand again with us?
All right, let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn back to the book of Proverbs. We're in Proverbs chapter two this morning, verses one through 22. Proverbs two, verses one through 22. If you're new to our church, we love to take books of the Bible like Proverbs and just walk straight through them because we believe that God speaks to us through his word and we desperately need to hear his voice. And so we began a journey through Proverbs a few weeks ago. Uh, This will probably take us through the summertime and uh, and it's just a a great book to learn about the wisdom of God. And I'm looking forward to... uh, this passage this morning that we're going to walk through together. So Proverbs 2, 1 through 22 is where we are. If you did not bring a Bible with you, that's okay. In the seat before you down the book rack, you're going to find a copy of the Bible. Pick that Bible up and find Proverbs 2 with us. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you to take that Bible home with you so you can read it and learn about the God that loves you and desires a relationship with you. If you're new to the Bible, Proverbs is really easy to find. If you'll take your Bible and open right up to the middle, you'll likely find yourself in the book of Psalms. And if you find yourself in the book of Psalms, then just go one book over and you'll be in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 2, uh, verses 1 through 22. Hey, be praying for our college students. I know this week is exam week, or you're kind of in the middle of it, like today's the day off, and then tomorrow you're back to exams, and and then they're gone. So many of our students will uh, go to different places during the summer, go back home. Some are gonna be serving on mission. Some will be right here. But uh, for a lot of our students, we won't see them again until the fall. Hey, we love you. We're praying for you and very thankful for you and look forward to hearing about all that God does in your lives this summer and look forward to having you back in the fall. Uh, But we're very thankful for you. Um, Proverbs 2, 1 through 22, as we're starting together, let me ask you a question. And this question might be controversial. I understand that, uh, but, but let's, just, let's just play along, right? So how many of you in this room, you're, you're, a, you're a dog person? Any dog people? All right, good, good, good representation. I already heard some booze. Okay, that's, yeah. How many of you are cat people? Like, yeah. <laughs> You're the ones with the problem. I don't understand why you're booing, right? So I don't know. So cats, dogs, like, I don't know. Whether you're a dog person or a cat person, we all love our pets, right? Like there's something about a pet, whether it's a dog or a cat, like that pet becomes a member of your family. We have a little dog named Bear and like, you know, we can't imagine life without him. He's a great little dog, all those kind of things. So I read a story this week about a lady who lives in Salt Lake City and who has a cat. And I know that she has a cat. So just take it for what it is. She has a cat and her cat went missing, which I would think would be a good thing, but she didn't think it was a good thing. So her cat went missing and, and you, you can understand the, the significance of losing a pet and thinking that that pet is lost. And so uh, she was very upset, obviously, and, and began to search for her a lost cat and searched the neighborhood, called her neighbors. Hey, have you seen my cat? Put up the missing cat signs, all those kinds of things, trying to find her cat and could not find her cat. Like a week goes by, the cat's nowhere to be found. She's wondering if the cat's ever going to come home, all those kinds of things. Well, well, as she is mourning the loss of her cat, after a week or so, she gets a phone call. She gets a phone call from California, a veterinarian office in California, because her cat had one of those microchips in it. You know, you can microchip your cat or your dog and, and you can track it all over the world, apparently. So this cat had a microchip. And so a veterinarian called from California and said to this lady in Salt Lake City, hey, just want you to know, I think I have your cat. And so she I deed the cat. It was indeed her cat. And the cat and her owner were reunited happily ever after. Well, you might be asking the question because I was asking the question, how did the cat get from Salt Lake City to California? Well, this lady, her husband, he had ordered some boots. He had ordered some steel-toed boots. In fact, he ordered six pairs of steel-toed boots because he didn't know which ones were gonna fit his feet. I don't know why he had to order six pairs to figure that out, but apparently it took him that many pairs. And so all these boots came to his house in a big box from Amazon. And so he gets the boots out, tries them on, finds the one that worked, and he puts the boots back into the box and then goes to get the tape to tape the box up. And apparently when he goes to get the tape to tape the box up, the cat jumps in the box. He tapes the box up, not knowing there's a cat in the box. And so apparently the cat had a nice ride on the Amazon truck all the way to California. Can you imagine being that Amazon worker and opening that return box and out pops a cat? Like that's a weird day, right? But apparently, right, like uh, the Amazon worker was nice enough not to, nice enough to take the cat to the veterinarian so that the cat could be traced back to the owner. All that to say, can you imagine But here's the deal. Think about that woman who lost her cat and think about losing something that's valuable. When you lose something that's valuable, you do whatever you can to get it back. 
you have things that are valuable to you, whether it's your cat, your kids, your whatever. You have things that are valuable to you that if they were lost, you would do whatever you could to find it. Now, here we are in Proverbs chapter two, and what Solomon continues to tell his son is that wisdom is valuable. And what we learned in Proverbs chapter one last week is wisdom is not lost. Like it's accessible. Wisdom is like a, a woman in the streets shouting above all the commotion. I'm here. You can have me. I'm accessible. You can find me. Wisdom is not lost. You can find it and you can have it. And what Solomon is now telling his son in Proverbs 2 is wisdom is so valuable that it's worth you pursuing with everything that you have. In this life, you are going to pursue lots of stuff. You're gonna pursue an education. You're gonna pursue a career. You're gonna pursue someone to marry. You're gonna pursue whatever it is, a hobby. You're gonna pursue lots of things in this life. But the only thing that's really worth pursuing at the end of the day is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because when you pursue Christ, your pursuit of Christ, now watch this, will change how you pursue everything else in this life. And so the pursuit of Christ is the pursuit that is ultimately worth it. And, 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 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, Paul says that Jesus, he is the wisdom of of God. So to pursue wisdom of God is to actually pursue Jesus. Now, I want you to understand, we've talked about this already, but let me help you to understand. When we talk about the wisdom of God, we're talking about something very specific. There's a general wisdom that, that everybody has, right? You've heard the statement before, right? Look before you leap. Uh, you don't have to be a follower of Jesus to figure out that's a good idea to look before you leap. That's just kind of common sense wisdom. But when Solomon writes about the wisdom of God, he's not talking about that common sense kind of wisdom. When Solomon writes about the wisdom of God, he is talking about pursuing God himself. You follow? And to pursue God is to understand, right? To understand that, that, that God is God. You're not. That he is holy and righteous. And, and to pursue God is to understand, right? Like I want to live my life for his glory. And so to pursue the wisdom of God is to make every decision in your life based on your understanding of who God is and what he's done for you. That's wisdom. Wisdom is to walk in the will of the one who has saved you. And that is worth the pursuit. And so what I wanna do is I'm gonna walk through these 22 verses with you. And I wanna show you two fundamental truths you must believe so that you can know that it is worth it to pursue the wisdom of God. That makes sense to you? Take your Bibles, Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 22. What I want to do right now is just read down through verse 11, and then we'll read the rest of the passage a little bit later on. It's Proverbs 2, 1 through 11. Go ahead and rise your feet as we honor the ring of God's word. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding, furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up success for the upright. He is a shield for those who live with integrity so that he may guard the paths of justice and protect the way of his faithful followers. Then you will understand righteousness, justice, and integrity. Every good path for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will delight you. Discretion will watch over you and understanding will guard you. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that, that you have made your wisdom accessible to us. We can know as we live by the spirit of God, we can know how to live for the glory of God. We can make decisions that are consistent with your will. And so Father, would you please help us this morning to continue to grow in the wisdom of God? And would you give us this morning a desire, a longing to pursue your wisdom? So Father, we trust right now that you're speaking to us. As you speak to us, help us to listen carefully to what you're saying with hearts that want to understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Now, here's what we've already said. 
We've already said that Proverbs 1 through 9, chapters 1 through 9, really serve as an introduction, if you will, to chapters 10 through 31. Chapters 10 through 31 are those pithy sayings that you're familiar with in the book of Proverbs, like train up a child in the way he should go. And when he gets old, he will not depart. Those kinds of things, sayings. Proverbs 1 through 9 is a series of poems written by Solomon to his son or sons. He wants his sons to be wise. And, and if we're real honest, as you read these first nine chapters, it kind of sounds like a broken record because that's what dads do. Amen? Like dads sound like broken records. They tell you the same thing over and over again, wanting you to get it. That's what we do. That's what dads do, right boys? That's what dad does. And so, so Solomon kind of does that in these first nine chapters. And so he's gonna continue to plead with his son to embrace or to pursue after the wisdom of God. Now, here's what I want you to understand about chapter two. Chapter two is full of conditional statements. Remember back to your English class. You know what a conditional statement is? A conditional statement is that if then statement. Let me show you as we're diving into the text. Let me give you some examples. Look at verse one. If you, right? Or you come down to verse three. If you, you come down to verse four. If you, and then you get the verse five and you get the thens, right? Verse five, then you, you come down to verse nine, then you. That's conditional statements, right? If you do this, if you think this way, if you live this way, then this will happen. And so really what's going on in the text is what Solomon is writing to his sons, right? If you do this, if you live by wisdom, then the then leads to the benefit. And so what Solomon is doing, he's saying, okay, here's wisdom. If you make this choice to pursue it, watch, you're going to see the benefits in your life. So we're gonna get to the benefits in the moment of pursuing wisdom. But before we get to the benefits, let's look at the ifs, right? He says in verse one, my son, if you accept my words. Now, before we get there, let's actually fast forward. Come down to verse four. If you, this is the last if you statement. If you seek it like silver, and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand. If you seek for what? Wisdom, like treasure. So, so you understand what Solomon is doing. In verse four, all Solomon is doing, now follow, he's saying to his son, wisdom is a treasure worth pursuing. It's like silver. Now, I, I don't know... Uh, if any of you in this room, if you're a collector of silver, uh, maybe you are a collector or not, um, but silver right now, because I checked this week, silver right now is worth about $28 per ounce. That's not bad. So, excuse me? Whatever that means, right? So, 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 what I, so just imagine. Imagine 100 pounds of silver. 100 pounds of silver would be about, I don't know, 46, 47, dollars $48,000, something like that, right? Now, now bear with me. This, this isn't going to happen, just, but let's just pretend like it did. Imagine there was 100 pounds of silver hidden in this room. And I said to you at the end of the service, hey, there's 100 pounds of silver hidden in this room. And whoever finds it at the end of the service, like it's yours. That would change the way we end our service, don't you think? Like it would be a little bit chaotic after we end our time together because every one of you in this room, I think, would want to find the 100 pounds of silver. Why? Because it's valuable. Now, what I'm telling you is that wisdom is not hidden. It's in plain sight for you. And it is yours today if you will pursue it. It is like a treasure. And, and you know this, that, that you are that kind of person. I'm that kind of person. It's just the way that we're wired, that we're always seeking after treasure. Some of you find value or treasure in, in, in your family, your career. You go down the list. Like we're all finding value or treasure somewhere. And what Solomon is saying is that at the end of the day, wisdom really is the treasure that is ultimately worth you pursuing. But here's what I need you to understand. You're not going to see the wisdom of God as a treasure unless a couple of things. Unless one, you keep the end in mind. We've already talked about this in Proverbs, but it's so important that you understand this, that wisdom has a destination. You remember us talking about that? The destination that wisdom of God has for us is ultimately eternity with him, life with him. The destination of wisdom is getting to the end of our lives and being conformed to the image of Christ, sanctified, looking forward to glorification. That's the end that we're aiming toward. And so since we know the end or the goal of wisdom, since we know that the 
end is being with him forever. We make decisions right now today based on what we know to be true about the end. You follow? And so you're gonna treasure wisdom as you keep the end in mind. And ultimately the end is what? It is being united with Christ forever. That's the end that we're looking forward to, right? Because we ultimately, we see Jesus as our treasure. Jesus is the one who lived and died and rose again for us to give us life abundant and eternal. And if you don't keep the person and work of Jesus central in your heart and mind, and, and that, that belief that there's going to come a day that I'm with him forever, then you're not going to treasure wisdom. What you're going to treasure is the here and now what I want in this moment, what I want right now. And so if you are going to treasure wisdom, it's only going to be a treasure to you as you keep the end in mind, that life is working its way for the follower of Jesus to that end point when you're going to be with him forever. And you make every decision in light of that reality. And so I just wanna stop right here, right? The first truth I want you to see in this passage is you must believe God's wisdom is a precious treasure that you can possess. This is the argument that Solomon is making, that wisdom is available to you. It is a precious treasure that right now you can possess. Now, with that in mind, back up to verse one, because now what I want you to see in verse one, two, and three is this progression that Solomon takes us on. Listen to verse one again. Proverbs 22, verse one says this, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands. Now, stop right there. Think with me, think with me. Are you, are you with me? Everybody still awake? When Solomon says, accept my words and store up my commands, what kinds of things do you think that Solomon was teaching his son? The things of God, right? Solomon is a wise king. I know at the end of his life, he's gonna have his mess up, but I'm certain as we read through Proverbs that what Solomon is teaching his son are the things of God. And so when he says, if you accept my words and store up my commands, He's talking about, listen, son, I'm teaching you the things of God. You need to listen carefully. You need to store them up. How are you doing at storing up the commands of God, the teachings of God? But listen to what it says. Listen closely to wisdom. Now go ahead and underline that phrase in your Bible, listen closely because, because here's the deal, here's the deal. Now, again, I'm not giving you anything that you've not thought about before or you don't know, but this is factual. Here you are in a room like this. And, and, and what you do every single week is you come to a place like this and do you know what we ask of you every week for about 40 minutes or 45 minutes or however long-winded I am? We ask of you to do what? Listen. But, but listen, listen, listen. We ask of you to listen with a conviction in mind that when we open the word of God together and we walk through the scripture together, you're listening to me teach or preach the Bible, but you're listening with this conviction that God does what? He speaks to us through his word. So as you're listening now, hopefully it's with the conviction that right now in this moment, the spirit of God is present and active and at work in this room speaking to his people. Do you share that conviction with me? Okay, so now listen, if you share that conviction with me, then that should what? It should change the way that you listen. Because here's the reality, and you know this, that in this room, we can listen in one of two ways. We can either listen passively or we can listen actively. And you know what it means because all of us, including myself, fall into the habit of passive listening. Passive listening is a lack of conviction. It's a lack of conviction that God is actually speaking in these moments. And so therefore, I'm not gonna give my best attention to what God is saying. Instead, I'm gonna let my, and you do it all the time. I do it all the time. I get it, so I'm not judging you. I'm just saying, this is what happens. You let your mind wander. As I'm preaching, right, you kind of tune the preacher out and you think about what you got to do when you leave this place. You think about things that, that are going on or you start scrolling your, your Facebook feed or Instagram feed or whatever the case may be. You're kind of passively listening because you're not in your own mind convinced that what's taking place right now, right, is a work of the spirit as he speaks to us through his word. But when you're convinced, now come on, come on, come on. When you're convinced that the spirit of God is actually present with us, speaking to us through his word, it changes the way that you listen because you know that every word the spirit of God says to you is what? Is absolutely life changing and transformative and you need it. And so it changes the way you listen. 
And now all of a sudden, when you're convinced that the spirit of God is speaking, you listen actively. You sit up, you open your Bible, you take notes. And not only that, you begin to pray that as I'm speaking or another preacher is speaking from the text, you're saying, God, would you please, would you please open my heart to your word this morning? Would you help me to listen well? Would you convict me of sin? After all, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter four, preach the word in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, train in righteousness. That's what's taking place right now. As the spirit of God speaks to you through his word, he's wanting to correct you in a good way to help you. He's wanting to rebuke you, to point out to areas in your life that are not conforming to his will. Do you see what I'm saying? Like these moments that we share together when the word of God is being spoken and not only in a, an environment like this, but anytime you are under the word of God, God is at work. And if God is at work, he is worthy of what church? Your best attention. He is worthy of you actively listening. And so what Solomon is saying to his son, listen, listen, closely because now watch this watch, watch this when you listen closely it's going to begin to affect your heart are you following the progression here's what Solomon is saying wisdom is a treasure worth possessing if you're going to possess this treasure you got to listen right? You've got to let your mind be consumed with the things of God. You've got to think on what God is saying in these moments. You've got to listen to his word. You also have to let wisdom consume your heart. Look at what the text says. Are, are you still awake? Listen to what it says. Verse two, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding. Go ahead and circle that word heart because I know in this room, you're a good Bible student and you understand what Solomon is saying when he talks about the heart because you know that the heart is what? The heart is the seat of your desires. It's why you say things like this, man, I love to, to, to just eat a lot of bluebell ice cream, right? Or I love to go to Chick-fil-A or I love this or I love that. You say those kinds of I love statements because that's what? That's what you desire, now follow the progression. What Solomon is saying is that when you understand that wisdom is a treasure worth possessing, it's gonna change the way that you listen because you believe that God is speaking to you from his word and giving you his wisdom from his word. And the more carefully that you listen, watch, it's gonna to begin to change or transform your desires. And your heart is going to be directed, look at what it says, towards understanding. Understanding what? God, who he is, what he's done, how he wants you to live. And now come on, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding. Furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, you see, you see the progression? You listen and as you listen carefully to what God's saying to you, it begins to direct your desires toward him. And then it begins to change the way that you actually talk. See what it says again. If you call out to insight, what is that? That's a prayer. God, help me. Help me to understand your word. Help me to understand how to live in wisdom. Help me to understand how to make choices consistent with your will, right? You pray, but then you talk. You talk to others about the word of God and what he's doing in your life. You see what I'm saying? All I'm saying is that what Solomon is showing us is that when you see wisdom as a treasure that's like silver, you just got to have it. And you know that wisdom comes from the word of God itself. Then you're going to begin to listen carefully to what God's actually saying to you. You're going to actively listen. And then as you actively listen, you're going to see your desires change and you're going to desire to actually walk with God. And then you're not going to be able to help it. You're going to want to talk about it. You're going to want to talk to him about it. You're going to want to talk to others about it. You're going to be consumed. You're going to have your mind consumed, your heart consumed, and your speech consumed with wisdom. Now, here's the deal. This is the fact. Every one of you in this room, every one of you right now, your heart, your mind, and your speech is consumed by something. The question is, is your heart, mind, and speech consumed by what's eternal? So 
Stacy and I, we've been married 16 years in May. And, and before we got married for a lot of years, I, I played a lot of golf. I, I started playing golf when I was in high school. I played through college and, and played uh, as a single man. And I was never like a really good golfer. Like I was always that guy that shot in the 90s, but that was good enough for me kind of thing. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed playing with my friends and all that kind of stuff. And, and so when Stacy and I started dating and got married, like I stopped because a wife's expensive. I didn't know if you knew that or not. Uh, and then when you have kids, like you add kids to that, like kids are really expensive. And so like a golf is an expensive hobby. And so I literally stopped playing golf altogether about 16 years ago. Like I sold my clubs and didn't pick one up again. And I didn't miss it. Like God just gave me different desires. Like I just didn't want to even play. Like I desired my wife. I desired my children. I desired spending time with my family. I mean, if I had four hours available, I didn't want to be on the golf course. I want to be with my family until about three or four months ago. Because now my wife works on Fridays. I got nothing to do, right? My kids are in school and we got some guys here in the church to play golf. And so, so I got invited out to play a few months ago. And, it, and, and, and literally like the first time I picked up a clubs in years. And when I picked up the clubs, it's like, all of a sudden something like the, 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 the pixie dust from the fairies came over me. And like, now I just want to be a golfer, right? Like it just, like, I couldn't believe it. Now, now I hadn't played in a long time, so I'm not good at all. But, but if you know anything about golf, you hit one really good shot and you think you're Tiger Woods and you can do it all the time. And so, so, and, and when I played golf years ago, there were things that didn't exist like YouTube. Did you know, like there were hours and hours and hours and hours of videos on YouTube about how to play golf well. And like, so I went down this rabbit hole a few months ago of watching all these videos from all these pros teaching me how to play the game of golf again. And listen, my clubs, they were 20 years old. So I'm gonna play golf again. You know what I have to have? New golf clubs, obviously. And so I got really consumed with wanting to buy a new set of golf clubs. And, and the beauty of YouTube is I could research every brand of golf club ever made to pick out the ones that I think are best for my game. And so I did it. Like I went down the rabbit hole of, of, of watching video after video of golf clubs and I read every review, review online and, and those things get expensive really fast. And so I finally, after searching for hours and hours and hours, ended up buying a set of clubs off eBay. I brought a picture the tailor-made sim twos and the reason why i bought them was because i could afford them right they were 500 bucks which is probably more than i should have spent but it was cheaper than some and so i bought them for 500 bucks and all the reviews here's what they said these are for high handicap golfers which is what i am and they said all the reviews said these clubs will add 10 yards to your shots these clubs will take numbers off your score i bought the lie and I've played about five or six rounds of golf now with my new clubs. And I'm still terrible. <laughs> like they didn't add any yards whatsoever. In fact, I probably hit the ball better with my old clubs. You see what I'm saying? Like, but all I'm saying, like for a couple of months, as I was really looking for those clubs, like I got consumed. Like my mind, I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to, I went down the rabbit hole and you, it was easy. I was amazed and I'm still amazed how easy it is for me to be consumed with stuff. And it's easy for you too. Think about it. It might not be golf for you. It might be something else, but it is easy for your heart and mind to get consumed by the things of this world. And, and here's the deal. Here's the deal. There's gonna come a day that my life is over. And I will stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And can I just tell you, I don't think God's going to care that I bought $500 golf clubs, right? What God does care about is the decisions I made every day to live for his glory. You see, I, I spend a lot of time letting my mind be consumed by things that in no way eternally matter. And you do too. And all Solomon is saying to us is there's a, there is something better to pursue. And that something better to pursue is the wisdom of God. And the way you pursue it is by opening your ears. Do not let these moments pass by every Sunday or anytime you're under the word of God. Listen closely because the spirit of God is speaking. And as he speaks, he's going to change your heart and he's going to change the way you talk. He's going to change your life. If you'll just take the time to actually open your ears and listen to what the spirit of God is saying to you. Wisdom really is a truth treasure that you can possess. Now, let me show you this next truth and we got to go even faster. You must believe God's wisdom is a precious treasure that you can possess. Go to the next slide. You also must believe that God's wisdom is beneficial for your life. It really is. Life is better when you live in the wisdom of God. Do you know why it's better? Because you don't do foolish stuff. 
That's why. And that's a big deal. Do you understand why I'm saying? And so here's what Solomon does. And we're going to do this quickly, but just bear with me. What Solomon does after he talks about wisdom being a treasure worth pursuing, possessing, he begins to give us all the benefits. Remember conditional statements. If, then. If you listen closely. If you seek if like silver, if, right, you allow it to direct your heart, then come down. Look at what it says. It's so good. Verse five, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Now, now let me stop right here. Here's what God, Solomon's going to do. From verse five down to the end of the chapter, he's going to give us the benefits of walking in the wisdom of God. And now here's what I need you to know. These benefits, these benefits that Solomon is going to lay out for us, these are all things that you actually want, right? Like everything Solomon is going to describe, whether you know it or not, these are the desires of your heart. You want these things. For example, we all want to know God. That's why you're here. Every person on the face of the planet ask these big questions. Is there a God? And if there is a God, how shall I live before him? And then that's a question that everybody asks because God has put that in our hearts. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11. Do you follow me? And listen to what the text says. If you seek it like silver, verse 4, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. You come down to verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So what Psalm is saying is that if you'll listen to wisdom, if you'll listen to the teachings of God's word, then you will actually know God. And not in the sense of like, I just know he exists out there somewhere and not in a sentimental sappy kind of way either, but like you will actually know him. You will know what it means to fear God, to have this conviction that God knows everything about me. And that is in a lot of ways a fearful thought, but at the same time, while he knows everything about me, good, bad, and ugly, he desires a relationship with me, right? And so I'm gonna live for his glory. You will understand the fear of God. You will have knowledge of the Lord. You will know, right? As you seek after wisdom, what God desires for your life. And so Solomon is saying, it's real simple, but it's a benefit. If you will seek after this precious treasure, you will actually know God. And that's why you're here. That's why you are in a discipleship group. That's why you go to a life connection group. That's why you open up your Bible because that's the desire of your heart. You want to know God. And Solomon is telling you, you can, you will. You do know God as you walk in his word. We all want to understand life. Every one of you in this room, like that's what you want. You want to know how life works. Why is it? that things happen the way they do? Why is it that we go through times of struggle and suffering? Why is it that life works the way that it does? Well, we don't have all the answers, but as you what? As you walk with the Lord, what do you begin to see, church? His perspective. And you begin to understand how life works because you begin to understand that we live in a broken world and God is at work through his son, Jesus Christ, to restore the world. You begin to understand like that, that suffering and, and trial and struggle, they're all a part of God's purpose to make you more like his son, Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? Like we all want to understand life. And what Solomon is saying is that after, as you seek after the wisdom of God, you begin to know God and you begin to understand life from his perspective. We all want a successful life. There's no one in this room that doesn't want a successful life. The problem is, is that we define success in very different terms than what God defines success. But let me show you what the text says. He says in, in verse five, you will understand, right? You come down again in verse six, there's that word understanding again. Uh, you're gonna come down a little bit later and he's gonna talk about knowledge and discretion and understanding again in verse 11. But look at what it says in verse seven. God stores up, what's the word? success for the upright. 
Now, you and I think that success is when I finally make it in my career or I'm finally able to buy that house I want or I have this much money in the bank or I marry that person or I get this degree or whatever it is. When I accomplish my goals, then I've been successful. But in God's economy, what is success? It's you simply living for his glory. That when you get to the end of your life, you can look back and you can say, no, I wasn't perfect in any way. But I walked with God. I learned from his word. I shared the gospel. I lived with integrity. I was just towards people. That, my friend, is success. And what Solomon is saying, listen, if you live by wisdom, you will find real success. Look what else he says. We got moved. We all want to know God. We all want to understand life. We all want a successful life. We all want an enjoyable life. Like every one of us want an enjoyable life. None of us are here saying this morning, man, I, I wish my life were a little bit more miserable. Like none of you do that because that's not, that's not what you want. You want joy. But look at what the text says. You come down, we're gonna come back to verse seven in a moment. He says, then you will understand righteousness, justice, and integrity, verse nine, every good path for wisdom will enter your heart. And look at what it says. Knowledge will what church? Delight you. Come on now, there's lots of enjoyable things in this life. Going and playing golf, it can be quite enjoyable. Taking a trip to the mountains can be enjoyable. Going to the beach can be enjoyable. Going to watch South Carolina play football, it's not enjoyable, but there's lots of things. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there somewhere, but anyway, there's lots of things in this life that are enjoyable. But now come on, come on, seriously. There is nothing more enjoyable than living in the will of God. There's nothing more enjoyable than serving together with God's people, right? And as you walk in the wisdom of God, you begin to understand that. I think about yesterday. Yesterday, we had the opportunity for some of us to go over to Northwood Wando Woods and help them put on a block party. The first time they had done ministry in their community in years. Can I tell you, there was much joy in that. As people came to that block party from the community and got to hear about a church that's trying to live again, that was far more enjoyable than most other things I did all week long. You follow me? Or, or, or I think about this morning, I was scrolling social media and, and I saw this morning where Pastor Jay over at Northwood Berkeley posted that today, the baptismal waters are stirring at Gethsemane Baptist, where they hadn't stirred for years. Like that's enjoyable. You see what I'm saying? To see God's work in the life of, to see people understanding righteousness, justice, and integrity. To see people understand the very heart of the gospel and to be a part, like, come on. What's happening at Wando Woods? We're a part of that. What's happening over at Northwood Berkeley? We're a part of that. Like we get to participate in those joyful stories because we've been obedient to the will of God. You see what I'm saying? Like, round of golf? Like, who cares? We're gonna see people baptized over in Berkeley County. We're gonna see a church live again in, in the heart of Wando Woods. Like, that's where joy is. You're gonna take your golf because it's a terrible sport anyway, right? But, but you see what I'm saying? Like, joy, like we're finding it simply by walking with the Lord and doing His will. Like, I'll take that every day of the week. You follow what I'm saying? It's what you want. You want joy. And Solomon's laying it out. Pursue wisdom, you got it. You want to know God. Solomon's saying, pursue wisdom, you got it. You want, right? You want to understand life. You want success. Solomon's saying, pursue wisdom, and you got it. And you also want this. We all want to be protected throughout life. Listen to what the text says. Verse seven, he stores up success for the upright. He is a shield for those who live with integrity. Underline that word shield. That's good. Because God is your protector, church. Now, let me, understand, let me help you understand what I mean when I say that he's your protector. Like you live in a broken world. Things are gonna happen, right? I, I, um, you remember my car that died? My 2015 Ford Escape that died? Transmission fell out, engine blew all that stuff, bought a car, at any rate, all that stuff. 
I sold my car, my 2015 Ford Escape yesterday. Somebody bought a dead car for me. That's wild. I put it on Facebook Marketplace. That was wild. Like I got a thousand messages from people wanting to buy my car. Like I'll give you $5 for it, whatever. You know, it was like, somebody came to my house and gave me $2,500 for a dead car. I thought that was really good, right? But can I tell you something? I was nervous the whole time because I don't know who this dude is, right? Like, I don't know what he's carrying. Like, I don't know if his intentions are good. Like, I, I don't know. And then he came and he gave me, watch this. He gave me $2,500 for my car. I signed a title. He gave it to me in $50 bills. That's all. I mean, I'm keeping that. <laughs> I got never held that many $50 bills at one time. You see what I'm saying? Like, it, it all worked out great. I mean, but, but, but here's the thing, right? Like, through that whole process, like, I didn't know. There was a lot of uncertainty. Is this guy a good guy? Is he gonna take me to the bank? Like, what, what's gonna happen here? Like, I don't know this dude. You see what I'm saying? Like, I'm not guaranteed to be protected in a sinful world from sinful people. You follow? Because sinful people do bad things to righteous people. But, 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 but watch this. What I am protected from is my own foolishness. That when I walk in the wisdom of God, do you know what I don't do? I don't make foolish, sinful decisions. That's what Solomon's getting to, that pursuing the wisdom of God as a treasure, it protects you from you doing really foolish things. He gives two examples, and we'll do this fast. Come down to verse 12, for example. Wisdom, verse 12, will rescue you from the way of evil from anyone who says perverse things, from those who abandon the right paths to walk in ways of darkness, from those who enjoy doing evil and celebrate perversion, whose paths are crooked and whose ways are devious. When you walk in wisdom, and he's already talked about this in chapter one, when you walk in wisdom, you're going to stay away from people who are going to lead you down a path of unrighteousness. You know this, your heart is easily swayed and you very easily follow the crowd if you're not careful. But when you walk in wisdom, wisdom protects you from making the foolish decision to pursue evil with evil people. He gives another example. Now this next one, I need to give you a couple caveats. We're gonna talk about this in much greater detail when we get to chapters five through seven of the book of Proverbs. And also need you to to remember, right, that Solomon is writing to who? His son, his sons, if he was writing to his daughter, this next section would probably sound far different. So just keep that in mind. But look at what he says. Wisdom will rescue you, verse 16, from a forbidden woman, from a wayward woman with her flattering talk who abandons the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God for her house sinks down to death and her ways to the land of the departed spirits. None return who go to her. None reach the paths of life. So follow the way of the good and keep on the paths of righteousness. Now stop right there. Here's the reality. As we walk through Proverbs over and over again, Solomon is going to warn us about the danger of sexual sin. We're gonna have to deal with it. And actually we're gonna have to deal with it a lot. That's exciting, isn't it? But, but here's the thing. The reason why Solomon deals with a lot because he knows the nature of the human heart. Later on in his life, he's gonna give into it himself. And how many people do you know whose lives are really messed up now because they made sinful choices to follow after sexual desire? Come on, I, I love you. But I know even in this church, there have been relationships that have been destroyed because of sexual sin. And so now what Solomon is saying, like that is a destructive path. And my friend, you need it. The wisdom of God. Because if you don't walk in the wisdom of God, your heart is so prone to go down the path of sexual sin. And you live in a culture that is so highly sexualized. You can't watch anything on any screen without some kind of sexual image coming across it. You can't get on the internet without the temptation and lure of pornography around the corner. You see what I'm saying? Like it is in your face all the time. And the reality is so many followers of Jesus fall because they don't have wisdom enough to keep themselves out of that mess. And what Solomon is saying, right? Go back to that slide. Wisdom will protect you. 
If you walk in wisdom, and, and here's the wisdom Solomon's gonna give. I'm giving, you, giving, it, giving it to you now, but Solomon's wisdom is going to be to husbands. Look at your wife. She is, right? The fountain of your love and desire. That's the advice he's gonna give his son, right? Like put your heart where it's supposed to be on the wife of your youth. You see what I'm saying? That's wisdom. And that wisdom will keep you from sexual sin. All Solomon is saying to us is that it really will. If you'll listen to wisdom, it will protect you from giving in to evil and seeing your life destroyed. Now, let me show you one more thing and we're done. You come down and look what it says in verse 21. For the upright will inhabit the land and those of integrity will remain in it, but the wisdom wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous ripped out of it. Inhabit the land. Now, in the context of Proverbs, when Solomon writes about inhabiting the land, what's he talking about? The promised land. If we live in wisdom, we'll be able to stay in this land. And in this land, there is blessing. Now, here we are, New Testament people. And the land we're looking toward is what? The presence of Christ forever. Being with him forever. That's the blessing. And we experience that blessing as we walk with Jesus, who is the wisdom of God. The problem is, right? While Solomon gives us this beautiful exposition to help us to understand our need to treasure wisdom, many of us don't because we're naturally foolish and we fail, we sin, we turn away from God. But because God loves us, he sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus is the wisdom of God who never failed the father. He never lived foolishly. And this one who never lived foolishly went to a cross to die for foolish people. He suffered the punishment that we deserved on the cross and then rose from the dead three days later so that all of our sins could be forgiven and so that we could be given the gift of life, abundant and eternal. So we could be given the gift of his spirit who lives inside of us and we could be given the promise of what? An inheritance, an eternal land with him, blessing the presence of God. True wisdom today for you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, true wisdom is giving your life to Jesus who is the wisdom of God. It is repenting of your sins and giving your life to him. And if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, as we end our time together this morning, there are two crosses in the corners of this room. Go to one of those crosses. There'll be somebody there who's ready to receive you and pray with you and help you begin a relationship with Jesus. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, what do you treasure? What do you treasure? This morning, as you've heard the spirit of God speak to you, how is he calling you to respond to his wisdom? What are you treasuring right now that's leading you on a path of destruction? Will you confess that? Will you ask the spirit of God to reveal anything in you that is leading you away from him rather than leading you to him? And will you ask God this morning to help you to walk in his wisdom, knowing the benefits of it? Father, thank you for this morning, for time in your word. Thank you that you're faithful to your people. Now, Father, as we have this time of invitation, Help us respond in faith and obedience. For that man, that woman who's in this room, who's never placed his faith or her faith in Jesus, I pray that person will come this morning, trusting you as Lord for the very first time. And for those of us in this room who are followers of yours, who, who may be treasuring things other than you, help us to again realize that you are worth the pursuit. There's great benefit in pursuing Christ as Lord and his wisdom. So Father, would you please Help us now to respond to your spirit's voice in faith and obedience, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. You rise your feet as we have time of invitation together. You come now as the spirit of God leads you.